Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Caritas. Today is October 7th, 2019. Thank you so much for joining me. The title of today's podcast is GE and GM, Trouble at the Plant. Today's focus is going to be primarily centered around those topics. We're also going to discuss the partial U.S.-Japan trade deal that Donald Trump signed today. We also have commentary from economic advisor Larry Kudlow and Donald Trump himself, once again talking about the U.S.-China trade talks and some of the developments that took place today, in addition to their comments. We also have Southwest Airlines. Their pilots are suing Boeing for lost wages due to the grounding of the 737 MAX aircraft, and that story is still unfolding as well. So there's a lot to discuss, a lot of moving parts, but this is actually timely because we've been seeing a lot of rolling over and deterioration in the manufacturing sector, which has been evidenced by PMI numbers that have been coming out over the past few weeks that are showing a deterioration and an outright contraction globally, but here specifically also in the United States of America. The trend for contraction globally has been one that we have been discussing here for months. We've been saying here for quite a while that the United States is not an island unto itself. Therefore, those global consequences were going to make their way here into the United States, and that is what we are starting to witness in the numbers. So with that said, let's get straight to the market because we do have a few topics we would like to discuss today. So the S&P gave back 13 points. The Dow lost 96. The Nasdaq lost 26 points. The Russell 2000, the small cap index, gave back three points. The Dow Jones Transports was down slightly, but let's just call it flat for the day. The New York Stock Exchange gave back four-tenths of one percent. Oil caught a very slight bid on trade optimism. No surprise there. We have WTI at $52.90 a barrel. Brent, the international metric, is trading at $58.74 a barrel. Gold and silver took a little bit of a whacking down about a percent each. Gold is now trading at $1,491 an ounce. Silver is at $17.41 an ounce. Buy low, sell high, ladies and gentlemen. Be diversified with precious metals. U.S. 10-year Treasury up a little bit and is now yielding 1.55%. And the VIX, the volatility index, gained about 5 percentage points for the day and is now trading at $17.86. So the markets whipsawed back and forth. The futures were negative. It opened to the downside. Then there was hope that there was going to be some sort of trade deal. And then that pulled back. And then it went back up. And then it pulled back again. Because you have Larry Kudlow out there reiterating the same point, which, you know, it just boggles the mind for anybody who pays any attention to this nonsense. Remember the story that we told you guys uh, a week and a half ago, that there was that rumor, that quote-unquote rumor that was being floated out there, that the United States was contemplating delisting Chinese equities from U.S. markets, remember that? And then only a few days later, Peter Navarro, a trade uh, advisor to the president, came out and said, no, we're not, we're not contemplating that. Well, when the news came out, the market sold off, as one would anticipate. Then, when you have the idiot Peter Navarro come out, who needs to be fired, comes out and says, no, 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 that was never being contemplated, that was never being discussed. Well, then the markets turned around and said, oh, well, that wasn't true, let's rally. Okay, so we thought this was put to bed. Well, for some reason, Larry Kudlow brings this up, or maybe he was asked a question, I didn't catch the, catch the whole interview and discussion when he was talking with reporters. But nevertheless, the point came up again that he said the United States is not contemplating delisting Chinese stocks from U.S. markets. And during the day when the market was listening to Larry Kudlow, they rallied. And then they must have had a moment. They said, well, wait, 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 wait. we heard this story before. We're going to sell off again. And that's exactly what they did. So again, we, the, as far as I'm concerned, this this story, that this this jerking us around should have been dead months ago. But the markets love it. The algos, the computer trading, loves it. They love the headlines. And that's what they do. And if they can scalp a few points, they're going to do it because they can do it more quickly than any human can. That's why it's the computers doing this stuff. But uh, that's not really chalking it up there for machine learning. I mean, what are they learning? That they continuously be fooled. But I guess the name of the game is just scalping a few dollars here or there. Something that broke, of course, after the market closed today 
is the United States has blacklisted about eight Chinese firms. Most of them, I believe, are tech firms, and they're citing human rights violations because of some contentions that are taking place over in China. We also have some news from China, which we discussed yesterday on the Week Ahead segment, that Li He, the Chinese chief negotiator, has taken off the table Chinese subsidies, meaning how China subsidizes their own industries, and intellectual property, and industrial practices, which of course would go lockstep with intellectual property. I thought those were sort of the golden goose, the golden geese, that uh, the United States was like, this is what we want. You have to change your laws. You have to stop subsidizing your industries. You have to change your ways when it comes to intellectual property, technology transfers, all that stuff. Well, if it's already being announced that you're not going to make any uh, leeway on that, then what's the point of having any negotiation at all? Because we've been told multiple times over by Peter Navarro, that idiot, and Donald Trump, that they don't want a partial deal. They want a full deal, and it has to be a great deal, and it has to be better for the United States <clears throat> than it is for China. Because after all, China's been ripping us off for the past 20, 30 years, and now it's our turn to rip them off, I guess, for the next 20, 30 years. I guess that would be fair trade. You rip us off for 20, 30 years, we get to rip you off for 20, 30 years. I guess that's how that works in the mindset of this White House. I'm not entirely sure, but that seems to be the case. So if you're going to have a deal that is great, that is not partial, and is better for the United States than it is for China, then what's the point of having any negotiations at all if China is now declaring that they are not going to give in on giving up their subsidies to their own industries, and they are not going to change their laws in respect to intellectual property theft or any other type of industrial practices that have become the norm when operating in China? Like I said yesterday in the week ahead segment, uh, we wouldn't tolerate that here if China or anybody else for that matter told us to change our laws or to change our ways. We wouldn't have it. Like I said, maybe if we gave up subsidizing our industries, then China would say we'll give up subsidizing ours. I highly doubt that's going to be the case because we are bailing out our farmers. We continue to bail out our banks. Don't, I mean, look, that was trillions of dollars recapitalization, quantitative easing. That's who that benefited, folks. That was subsidies. That was a bailout. That's what that is. Or oil companies, some of the largest companies and corporations in the world get bailouts or get subsidies from the United States, which means you and me, our tax dollars are going to the world's largest corporations. Does this make any sense at all? No, it doesn't, but that's what happens. This is the swamp. Is it being drained? No, it isn't. So, you know, you got to open your eyes. You got to start paying attention. We've been subsidizing industries for a very, very long time. You want to understand a little bit more in detail? Then buy our book, The Cynic's Guide to Investing. We have a chapter devoted to lobbying. And when you understand how much money is thrown around from big pharma, from big banks, from big oil and other big energy firms, and from the military industrial complex, you start to connect all the dots. And it starts to make a whole lot of sense. No wonder they get so many subsidies. No wonder they have so much tax treatment preference. You know, it, it starts to make sense. So maybe if we give up subsidizing our industries, China will say, yeah, we'll do the same. I highly doubt either is going to be the case, and I highly doubt that the United States would trust China, and I highly doubt that China would trust the United States of America. So unless they want to get together and say we're going to buy more soybeans, well, ain't that grand. Now, I'm telling you, good thing for the farmers, I guess, if they're going to resell or start to sell their soybeans, but we've already seen the supply chain starting to shift. China is going around. They're buying time. They've been going around to Argentina. They've been going to Brazil. They've been going to Russia saying, look, can you guys pick up the slack for what we've been buying from the United States? And it appears at this current moment that they have been. So, you know, do you think the presidents of Argentina, Brazil, and Russia are just going to rule over if there is some sort of agreement between China and the United States? I highly doubt it. Donald Trump wouldn't just roll over. President Xi wouldn't just roll over. So this is not going to be easy at all. Now, this should almost be a no-brainer. There's 1.3 billion people over in China they need to eat. Yet somehow Donald Trump has screwed this up because we have farms that are going bankrupt. We have farmers who are being bailed out. Again, you and me are bailing them out. He wants to continue to claim that China is paying these tariffs, which is a falsehood. It is an outright lie, a degree of incompetence because he doesn't understand how tariffs operate or because he's listening to that idiot Peter Navarro. I don't know what's... All of them are unacceptable. 
And we've been talking about this for months. But nevertheless, this is the reality that we face, and so this is the reality that we have to deal with. Talking about all this money that's coming into the U.S. Treasury. Well, then why do we have $1 trillion deficits? And why are we going to have trillion dollar deficits as far as the eye can see? It just doesn't add up, folks. It doesn't add up. So you got to open your eyes. You got to start paying attention to this stuff. Because 1.3 billion people, they got to eat. So it should be a no-brainer that they should be buying agricultural products from the United States. But they're not anymore. So somehow the, President Trump screwed that up. However, they might actually need to buy some pork, which would fall under the category of agricultural products. Well, why do they have to buy pork? Because of the swine flu outbreak. I'm not going to go into it, but there's been a big, you know, outbreak amongst pork. And, you know, that is basically a staple of Chinese diet. It's, you know, it's our chicken basically here in the United States. So they got to go around the world to find pork. And now, well, you got to feed 1.3 billion people because empty stomachs are the cause of revolution. And the Chinese don't want to have that now, do they? They got enough problems with Hong Kong. They don't want to have it internally as well. So they're going around and they're finding pork. Now, do you, if you think soybeans and pork are going to save the U.S. economy and the global economy, you're smoking something. So that's the news on that front. There is that uh, partial trade deal between the United States and Japan, which is really a big nothing burger in and of itself. That, again, goes to more agricultural products. But the big crux of the matter has to deal with tariffs that are placed on the auto industry, which is where there remains a big gap. That's why this is a partial deal. So despite the fact that one would maybe think that Donald Trump and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of Japan have a fantastic relationship, uh, there is still a great divide over a deal with U.S. Japan. And of course, this is not the granddaddy of them all. So the markets really couldn't care less about U.S. and Japan. And I also think that this doesn't even meet the threshold and the levels that were already in place under the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP. So it is even falling short of that. And we still have uh, trade issues surrounding auto tariffs. So we'll keep you posted if those ever come around. Uh, but uh, I don't think that's going to be anytime soon. So we have the continued market manipulation from Larry Kudlow, from Donald Trump himself making the statements that he thinks China wants to come to make a deal. Uh, although what we just said has been reported, he knows this, but he can't help himself and he has to continue pushing this narrative. Although the markets really didn't buy it because they closed in the red today. But we'll see. Tomorrow's another day. One day does not make a trend. Now to some of the other stories that are a little bit bigger. I'm going to start first with Boeing because I just want to sort of set the stage for what could happen because we always talk about what's going to be the catalyst that could really throw the U.S. economy into recession or to have a major pullback in the stock market. Uh, you know, we went through our list very early on in this podcast back in February, if not early March, in regards to the 30 market risks for 2019. That was a list that was produced by Deutsche Bank. Of course, we immediately made at 31 points, with the next point being the collapse or the failure of Deutsche Bank, which, of course, Deutsche Bank was not going to admit on that list. So we went through that. I might have to go through that again now, just as a refresher, since we're in the fourth quarter, just to see what has maybe come to fruition, what still remains a risk, what is a bigger risk, what is less of a concern. But then there's all those other things that you have to think about that could come out of right field or left field and just out of the woodwork. One of those things potentially could be Boeing. Boeing is a member of the Dow 30. It has a heavy weighting with the Dow. So if, the, if Boeing stock is doing very well, Chances are it is carrying the Dow component with it, and likewise, if it's doing poorly, chances are it's pulling it down with it as well. And that's the case for probably about five or six uh, major components of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Now, what was originally reported as being a story that had to deal with software malfunction and maybe the fault of the pilot or even the fault of Boeing not adequately training pilots on how to uh, maneuver and handle the 737 MAX aircraft uh, might now be turning into something that is a little bit more mechanical, a little bit more structural in nature. And if that is the case, look out below. Because this could mean a, I don't necessarily know if it would be a collapse of Boeing, they are a huge corporation, but this would take, uh, put a big dent 
in their revenues, in their earnings, and maybe most of all their credibility. Because we are literally talking about life and death here. And we already know that death has been involved on a couple separate accounts. So what I'm talking about here is if this is more than a software glitch that their engineers can't fix because it's bigger than a software glitch, it's mechanical in nature, and you know, changing the computer code is not going to change the aerodynamics and the structure of this aircraft, they got a big problem. All of those airplanes that have been ordered or are on back order now, they're done. That's billions and billions of dollars that are gone. It's lost. So now you have a daisy chain effect. You're going to have the airlines losing business because they have all of these airplanes that they've spent billions of dollars on that they're not making any money off of. They're only going to make money off of these assets, these airplanes, if they're using them, if they're charging price tickets. If they're not doing that, they're not making any money. So they're sitting there, they're grounded. That's why you have airline pilots from Southwest who are suing Boeing for lost wages because Southwest Airlines only employs 737 aircraft. It's basically their business model of standardization. That way, all of their mechanics, all they have to know and master is the 737 aircraft. If they need uh, inventory, all they have to order are, are parts for the 737. So it's a form of standardization, okay? This will have downward, downstream effects for other airlines as well, globally, because many other airlines, globally, have purchased the 737 MAX aircraft. And depending on the country, you have obviously different regulatory authorities who are going to make judgments as to whether or not this aircraft is safe to, to fly once again. Well, so far, most of them have said, no, it's not. And we are still underway with those investigations. If it is determined that this is a mechanically unsound aircraft, Boeing is in a lot of trouble, especially, especially if it should be found that the executives or some major decision maker within Boeing knew that this was not structurally sound, but they said, we've put so much money into R&D, we already have the plane being built, uh, we just have to keep going with it, and hopefully everything will work out at the end. Hopefully there are engineering tolerances, and it'll stay within those ranges, and everything will be A-OK. -okay. Well, so far that's not the case because we've had a couple down airlines uh, over the past, what, several months when they both went down within uh, the same time span of each other. So this can cause huge ripple effects throughout the market because not only will this affect Boeing, this will affect the steel and aluminum industries. This will affect the airline industries because they're going to have lost revenue. They got all of that money outflow, but they're not generating anything because these aircrafts are grounded. So what does that mean? One of two things, if not both. That means the airlines are one, going to lose money, but they're also going to pile on Boeing and sue them for lost wages and basically being defrauded potentially. Again, that's speculation, but this is what I'm telling you. This, these are the types of events that nobody can predict. These are the things that come out of left or right field. We can put our fancy list together. Deutsche Bank can do it. Morgan Stanley can do it. They can all do it. But these are these one-offs that nobody sees coming. And I'm just saying that this is the possibility. Same thing like we said earlier, and we're going to have that discussion here in a little bit in regards to General Electric. But sticking here with Boeing, you're going to have Airlines losing money. They are potentially going to sue Boeing for lost revenue and for being defrauded. And or those insurance companies, because I can imagine, I am no airline expert. I do not do research specifically to the airlines. But I would have to imagine that these airlines have insurance on these airplanes. And so it's either going to be the airlines who are directly going to sue Boeing or they're going to file a claim, a big claim, with their insurance companies, who in turn are going to say, oh, hell no, we're not paying for all this. We're going to sue Boeing. So just like we talked about a few weeks ago, we had Purdue Pharma, the manufacturer of OxyContin, they filed for bankruptcy. Why? Because of the onslaught of legal issues for being sued by states, by families, by individuals. The same thing could potentially happen with Boeing if, and this is a big if, if it is found that the 737 MAX aircraft is structurally unfit. So that's beyond computer programming. It's beyond training pilots on how to properly uh, handle this aircraft. It is an engineering flaw, and this thing is not safe for travel. If that happens, look out, because that will have ripple effects on that industry alone, 
and through the steel industry, through the aluminum industry, and everything else that goes in to that supply chain for, for manufacturing aircraft. And you also have to understand the trust deficit that will go along with it. If, if Boeing should survive, it'll take years for people to once again trust Boeing. And there's really only two major aircraft manufacturers in the world. We have Boeing here in the United States, and you have Airbus in Europe. So that's something to be mindful of. Moving onward, we have the, the strike is continuing with the UAW and GM, with now it's being reported that these talks are getting a little bit more heated, that they are moving further and further away from getting a deal, and we are now on already our fourth week. I can't believe it that we are on our fourth week of these negotiations. And one of the big sticking points that, that has been reported is that the UAW is looking for guarantees and assurances that General Motors will continue to keep certain plants in operation. Well, GM doesn't want to give any type of guarantee. Now, I'm sure when it comes to a lot of the labor disputes with the with the compensation, you know, Obviously, the union's going to go high, GM's going to go low, maybe they'll meet somewhere in the middle. That's par for the course, that's understandable. But making a commitment to keep plants here or keep plants open there, that's something that GM, at least at this point, is not willing to commit to. If they can send these jobs overseas or across the border to Mexico or even to Canada, uh, they're likely going to do so. So they're not going to make that commitment. Now, when these talks first started, you had some noise being made by Donald Trump trying to inject himself and basically knocking their heads together to get a deal done. But ever since, you haven't heard much talk about it. Not that I really want to hear Donald Trump talk about this because this isn't his business. He's not the president of corporate America. He's the president of the United States. Uh, this is an issue between General Motors, a private corporation, and its employees through their union, the UAW. So, but nevertheless, I am surprised that Donald Trump hasn't been chiming in, although that he does have a lot on his plate, obviously, at the moment. Uh, but this is going on the fourth week. This will continue to have, obviously, uh, repercussions on those employees themselves, who I believe are getting paid maybe $250 a week, uh, which can only go so long for most of these people, I'm sure, especially those who may have been part-time uh, and obviously aren't making as much money. So $250 might carry them for a little bit, but will they be able to sustain that for the long haul? That remains to be seen. This will also have a downward effect on manufacturing because they're not making anything. They are shut down. They are on strike. And this is likely to continue because I just don't know how GM is going to make any guarantee or give the UAW any sort of assurance that they are not going to move plants, especially at a time when we are anticipating a big slowdown in the overall economy anyway. So how are they going to make those that type of that type of assurance to the UAW? It's very difficult, which is understandable. But that's something to be mindful of as well, because that will also put downward pressure on the markets. That will continue to put downward pressure on the steel industry, the aluminum industry, everything. Again, that whole supply chain with the auto industry, which is a major, major component of the overall U.S. economy. Now to General Electric. We stated a couple months ago already, I think it was back in August, we had forensic accountant and his team, Harry Markopoulos. This is the individual who outed Bernie Madoff in that huge Ponzi, scam, Ponzi scheme uh, during the height of the Great Recession. He was out with a report that has been filed with federal authorities claiming that General Electric GE, a blue chip company, a household name, has been cooking their books accounting fraud for years. They have been, in, this is according again to Harry Markopoulos, they have been engaged in accounting fraud for years. Now, as a side note, but an important one, it is, it is known, and this is admitted by Harry Markopoulos himself, that he has joined up with a short seller, a hedge fund who has a short position with General Electric. So there is obviously a financial benefit if General Electric goes down. But it's also a financial benefit for Harry Markopoulos because the way that he and his company make money is by outing accounting fraud and reporting it to the necessary authorities. So when he turned over his report to federal agencies, stating with his evidence, with his report, uh, he it anticipates that if the federal government pursues charges against General Electric, that he will get a portion of those damages. 
So that's how that works. There's a lot of people out there like that. We talked politically about people looking into the Clinton Foundation uh, earlier on in this podcast, back all you know, all the way back in February, March of this year. Same type of thing. These are basically external whistleblowers. These aren't people who have inside information. They are not internal employees of the Clinton Foundation or of General Electric, but through um, public access of financial statements and perhaps filing FOIA, Freedom of Information Act requests, they can get this information and then they can go and they can do their forensic accounting and then they can make a determination as to whether or not they believe there is a a case to be brought for fraud. Now, the interesting thing that Harry Markopoulos stated during a handful of interviews because he made it uh, around the news circuit that day when he uh, turned in his report uh, that this is bigger. This is bigger than Enron and WorldCom combined. And if history is any indicator, according to Harry Markopoulos, once public allegations have been made and were made against Enron and WorldCom, those companies filed for bankruptcy within four months. Well, (laughs) this was back, I think it was in, in August already. I mean, time's going so fast. I believe that's when it was, though. Already back in August. And so we're basically entering that four-month period here. By the end of this year, by very early next year in 2020, if history is any guide, and if this is true, that Harry Markopoulos and his team of forensic accountants, this is true, then GE might be in a world of hurt. And with it, a whole host of other things. And again, this even ties into Boeing as well, because General Electric is a manufacturer of aircraft engines. So look, This is a daisy chain, folks. I tell you all the time, I stress the interconnectedness of everything, and it's difficult to do so because the interconnectedness, it's such a web, it's, it's ridiculous. It's so highly complex, but just having a little bit of a grasp to understand that there is interconnectedness will do you a world of good. Now, one of, now, that was just background to bring you up to speed on that for those of you who may not be aware that that was a report that was filed by Harry Markopoulos in regards to GE. But the reason is because we're talking about GE today is because it was announced today that GE is freezing pensions for 20,000 employees with salaried benefits in an attempt to reduce its $8 billion pension deficit, and that it would also freeze supplementary pension benefits for about 700 workers. Current retirees receiving their pension payments will not be affected and no new hires have been enrolled in the pension plan since 2012. So here we go again. Another company who has originally signed on to a defined benefit plan, being a pension, is now freezing it, and now they're going to put their employees on the defined contribution plan, which is more so the norm. Those are your 401ks. And, you know, this too is going to have downstream effects, because I'm sure most of these employees, these 20,000 people, are not going to be too happy about this. But nevertheless, that's the case. And, you know, it's not just GE, so don't think that I'm picking on GE. You have a handful of companies who have also done the same in the recent past. You have Avery Dennison, you have UPS, IBM, DuPont, a handful of companies continue on this trend. Another interesting thing here is we have this is from a art- an article from Market Watch, so I'm just reading this one paragraph here. The state of single-employer pensions are improving and moving away from a deficit according to the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, the federally instated insurer of private pension plans. But multi-employer plans are in trouble. About 130 of these plans which cover 1.3 million people, are at risk of running out of money, you heard me correctly, running out of money within the next 20 years. And if nothing changes, the multi-employer branch of the PBGC that ensures these plans will also be out of business by 2025. That's five years away. So, you know, you can talk all you want about soybeans and pork bellies, but that ain't going to save the day, folks, because GE is in a world of hurt. You have an economy that is slowing down globally. The interconnectedness of all of this is 
it's quite it's quite astonishing, and it's something that interests me to a great deal. But you just have to understand and have an, a respect and an appreciation for it. And this is why so much gets disrupted when you have these trade talks or this trade war that's going on because it causes a whole bunch of uncertainty. And again, the global economy, the U.S. economy was slowing down before this happened, but the trade war exacerbates these problems. You have a whole host of other geopolitical risks that we talk about all the time, but I don't want to go off topic. So just getting back to this, the stories that we covered, these are industrial, GE, the UAW on strike with GM and Boeing. Now, Boeing is somewhat speculation, but it's one of those things that can come out of right, left field, behind the tree, you're not paying attention, boom, knocks you out. That's something to be mindful of because that will have downstream, upstream effects. GE, is this a further crack in their foundation? Something that Harry Markopoulos and his team were basically warning against only a couple months ago. Is this unraveling? Couple that with the fact that you have overnight lending in the repo market that is in dire straits right now that we talk about here all the time in regards to the Federal Reserve, or at least for the past few weeks, we thought we were going to be one and done, but no, it's not. Again, I'm going to hold my tongue, keep topic here with the industrials. So if this continues, this will bring the markets down. This will have major effects on obviously the industrial sector, and it will have ripple effects to the service economy as well. So a lot to be mindful of this week as we progress. I think the main focus is going to be on uh, the U.S.-China trade talks, and then another story that we're probably going to get to tomorrow a little bit that also came out today, but that was just not my focus, was Donald Trump pulling troops out of Syria and allowing the Turkish uh, military uh, to engage in operations there. So we'll have a discussion on that tomorrow unless there's something else uh, that is breaking. So thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure having you as always. Please like, share, subscribe, and get the word out and leave your comments. We do love hearing from you. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capital News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.